also tomorrow. Um, I'm going to try to get through some of the content we were going to cover yesterday in this video, um, and I'll shoot another one tomorrow over the weekend um, about the Russian Civil War. But for now, I want to get through sort of the, the Russian Revolution. Some of this we've covered. Some will be new to you. Um, so I'm going to try to move quickly, at least at the beginning, since we've talked about some of it. So anyway, we talked preconditions for sure, the rigid monarchy, the agrarian farming of uh, Russia, uh, even though serfdom was technically abolished uh, in 1861, uh, peasants really struggled, and, and that was the majority of the Russian population. Um, this is the dynasty that was in charge of that rigid monarchy uh, at a glance, kind of uh, Nicholas, Alexander, Alexander, Nicholas. Um, the one we're going to be concerned with with the Russian Revolution is Nicholas II, but uh, just for background, we're going to talk about Alexander II and Alexander III a little bit um, because of how they set up what's going on in Russia. So there are sort of two periods of modernization that we're going to look at. One is after the Crimean War during the reign of Alexander II. The other one is during the reign of Alexander III under his finance minister, Sergei Witte, which you remember from your reading. Um, so after this humiliating loss in the Crimean War, which was, as I said, over, over uh, Christian lands, um, Alexander II says, well, we really got to modernize Russia. And the most important of that was uh, industrialization. And one of the reasons that they lost the Crimean War was because of railroads uh, not being able to get supplies and troops to the front lines quickly enough. And so sort of industrialization was an, was an easy choice economically in terms of modernizing Russia. Um, and, and the second was sort of creating some sort of political freedom, which is these the um, some stavos, which were local governments that were democratically elected. What we're going to find out, however, is that they had very little power, and that the existing bureaucracy at the center of uh, you know with the monarchy and in, in the in the major cities still really controlled what went on in Russia, uh, and these were toothless, uh, for lack of a better word. And then finally, the social reforms, at least uh, with respect to, to legal reforms, made it a little easier to live in Russia, particularly if you, and you look to see then the third point, reduced discrimination, if you were Jewish uh, or if you were a member of one of the, uh, um, like the, like whether you lived in Poland or Ukraine, if you were an ethnic group within Russia, you were better off uh, with these legal reforms. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the sort of the most significant of those is the equality under the law, which is crucial. Um, to make that known to, to the country, that that's, that's the direction in which Alexander II was headed. Uh, and then uh, here's a case study of one of those, which is sort of the industrialization. Look at the increase in railroad tracks between 1860 and 1900. Uh, it's major. Uh, and this is a result of loss in the war, but, but also uh, a Russia that wants to industrialize and be a major player on the world stage, and they're behind. Uh, and it's time to get going. So after Alexander II is actually killed, he's assassinated, um, Alexander III takes over, and he's much more conservative. He believes in the power of the Romanov dynasty and doesn't necessarily want to open up Russian society at all. Um, fortunately, his finance minister, Sergei Witte, does, uh, and you can see what he does in this slide. He continues to uh, industrialize and, and increase the size of railroads, creates a protective tariff, which basically helps Russian industry by putting taxes on imported goods. But then he also does stuff internationally with getting Russia on the gold standard so that they're in the same uh, economic position as the other major players on the world scale, sort of your, your Western powers, if you will. And then finally, he uses the Western powers to benefit Russia by bringing them in to build industry in Russia, um, particularly factories built by Western um, uh, businesses, engineers, whatever, uh, in order to quickly modernize, industrialize, um, and, and sort of make Russia a, a more international power economically. Um, so that's sort of the two periods of reform there for Russia. Um, but what we find out in 1905 during the Russo-Japanese War uh, is that it, all that is, is for naught because Russia loses another war. And it's actually sort of a result of these economic changes. So these economic changes sort of push Russia to look externally, look internationally to make more money, uh, to, to own more land, more, to get more raw materials, to go to your factories that you're creating, etc., etc. You know how it works. And um, in particular, they're looking for warm water ports. One of the things about living in Russia is your ports can freeze. Um, and warm water ports are obviously desirable for your navy, but also for commerce. 
And they end up in this dispute with Japan over Manchuria, which is a northeastern province of China and also Korea. And Japan diplomatically tried to work this out with Russia, and, and Russia broke off negotiations. And so Japan attacked. And uh, when it was all said and done, Japan emerges victorious in this war. And because of that, once again, the Russians realize uh, that they need to make some changes. Um, and this also marks Japan's emergence onto the international stage. So uh, during that, uh, we have this revolution of 1905 <clears throat> in Russia, uh, which we also call Bloody Sunday, because those who are poor, not doing well, peasants, laborers, and now army, uh, are really upset. Uh, we see some, as a result of the turmoil, independence movements going on in the provinces, and the people come together and they write a petition, and they go to have Nicholas uh, respond to their petition about the problems in Russia. And he doesn't, because his imperial guard opens fire on these demonstrators who are delivering this petition, um, and it's a disaster. And so because of that, the negative press that comes out of that, and, and deaths, and uh, the fact that now Nicholas really looks like he's out of touch with the people, etc., etc., leads to this. Um, we see political parties re, you know, rejoin the fold uh, stronger than ever. We see workers strike, and here's an example of that, this railroad car that's been flipped over. And we see unions, so the, the, your laborers that join unions, actually the unions start to join each other into sort of some kind of like super union, uh, which uh, in the end is sort of moderately successful. But the point is people are building coalitions. Uh, including the peasants. There's examples of peasants rising up and killing the landowners or refusing to pay the landowners the taxes or debts that they owe them. Uh, and then finally, troops mutiny, which you see a picture of that on the right. This is an artistic rendering of the mutiny on the battleship Potemkin. And there's a movie about that if you're interested. Um, so obviously things aren't going well for Nicholas. So what he does to maintain his power is he says, okay, fine, I will announce some concessions. Here's what, here's what I'll do for you angry people, uh, you know, after, of course, I shot at you guys, um, which is uh, I'll open up more civil liberties, freedom of press, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, universal suffrage, um, and I'll create a democratically elected parliament who will have or which will have a check on Nicholas's power, and Nicholas will have a check on its power, sort of in the classic Montesquieuian sense, so that the Duma, which is the parliament, can pass laws, but Nicholas has a veto power, and Nicholas can initiate laws, but the Duma has a veto power, supposedly. The key to this is in the last point in this slide, which is this splits the opposition. So the cadets, or the people who wanted a constitutional democracy, said, well, finally, we have a constitutional democracy, and they're happy. Whereas the socialists, or the Soviets, don't think this has gone far enough. But because the opposition is split, Nicholas remains in power, the Duma exists, um, and what's going to happen is he's going to use it to benefit himself. So Nicholas has the power to disband a Duma if it can't agree. He does precisely that with the first and second Dumas, and then he illegally changes the laws of the Duma so that he can appoint more of his own men into the Duma who are looking out for his interests. And that makes it so the Duma is even less uh, um, of a democratically elected body and even less likely to uh, oppose what Nicholas wants. So it doesn't work all that well. And we're going to see another trigger for another revolution in another war, not Russo-Japanese, this time World War I. Russia had backed Serbia um, for ethnic ties, really, and enters World War I in 1914. Um, and you see that it goes very poorly for Russia on the battlefield. Um, and we looked at Tannenberg and Mezuri and Lakes in class. Russia loses a lot of men quickly. Um, it's bad. And in August 1915, to increase morale, Nicholas II has to ride to the front lines um, and try to sort of increase morale and, and help Russia win the war, etc. It, it doesn't work. The Russians keep losing battles. Um, what it does do, however, is make sure that the seat of government in St. Petersburg is run by his wife, Tsarina Alexandra, and her closest advisor, Rasputin. And you all know sort of the hazy story behind him uh, and his background. We talked about it in class. I don't want to get into it here, but uh, the people didn't like that. And the Duma didn't like that. Eventually, when, this, when uh, it's at a breaking point with the war going poorly and, and people doing poorly because goods, uh, resources, whatever, were being allocated to the military and helped to try to win this war, but it wasn't going well. 
so the farmers, laborers, soldiers who are struggling um, sort of get together and, and demonstrate in St. Petersburg again, much like they did in 1905. Uh, and Nicholas can't hold on to power. He doesn't have any authority on which to stand with respect to how the war is going, or he doesn't have sort of a solution to figure out what's going on or how to sort of split the opposition the way he did last time with his October manifesto to improve state order. Uh, he doesn't really have another chance at that, um, so he abdicates. He tries to pass power on to a sibling, uh, and it doesn't work because that person doesn't want it, obviously. And Russia is without a monarch, so the first time the monarchy is abolished, and we create a couple of sort of uh, governments form. The provisional government is created, that's what it's called, which is the government that's going to take over for the war and, and be sort of the national government of Russia under the leader of the Zemstavos, um, Georgi Lvov, who's a cadet, constitutional democracy again. I put the next note, he lasts four months to show you how tough it was, but I also put the pet, that the Petrograd Soviet is formed. Um, you probably heard Petrograd, St. Petersburg changes its name to Petrograd here, uh, and obviously Soviet is your socialists, um, and they are created to look out for the people who are struggling and who really were instrumental in this revolution, which are your workers and your soldiers in the city of St. Petersburg. So uh, this is setting the stage for what's going to be a controversy between these two factions um, now that the monarchy is gone. So the provisional government does two things, the next two slides, April and July crises, uh, which really bother the people. One is they say that they're going to stay in World War I, and the second is they actually order an offensive in World War I into Austria-Hungary, which makes people angry again. So both of these cause problems. Uh, I'm going to hold off on Lenin because I want to talk about him in class. He goes against the provisional government here, but uh, in the July crisis, it, it gets even worse, which is, you know, they say, well, we're, we're going to go on an offensive. And any troops obviously don't want to go on an offensive. They don't want to risk their lives for what they view to be a losing cause. The socialists don't want an offensive. They don't agree with the war anyway. Um, and, you know, the provisional government is just trying to maintain its position in that war and hopefully get a victory to increase its, its popularity. Um, but it goes the other way. Uh, the riots happen again in St. Petersburg, and this time the government shoots, their, their troops shoot at the protesters from the rooftops. You know, disaster, and for the provisional government to hold on, what they do, and this is a smart move, really, to keep their power, which is they say, uh, this is all the Soviets doing, all these riots, all these problems in St. Petersburg. They're undermining us. They're working against us. It's hurting us in the war efforts, hurting us at home. And they say, this is coming from Vladimir Lenin, who's the leader of the socialists. And he has been sent here by Germany to do this. Uh, and uh, this actually moves Lenin into hiding, and it sort of holds on for the provisional government for a little longer until here, which is another problem for the provisional government. So they say, well, here's what we'll do also. In addition to sort of going after the Soviets, getting rid of Lenin, is we're going to call a group, a meeting of all factions of Russian society to get together and talk about what to sort of do next and open up the process, liberalize the process, to make people feel like they have a say. This leads to the Soviets boycotting, the Bolsheviks really, or socialists, boycotting this meeting. And it also leads to those who don't think the provisional government is doing enough to get together in the form of the Red Guard, um, which is a little bit on the next slide. And to respond to this, what looks like Red Guards and more protests and all this, a uh, member of the provisional government, General Kornilov, takes matters in his own hands and brings troops back from the front line to put down these protests that are going to occur from the socialists. Um, but that only makes the socialists more likely to protest and get together and arm themselves, etc. So the leader of the provisional government after that guy, Lvov, Alexander Kerensky, fires him, uh, which is the end of that guy. But again, the, the lines are drawn in the sand. We have the Soviets who are very against the pro provisional government and the provisional government that's doing whatever it can to hold on which is tough when they're losing the war. Uh, and it, it takes until October uh, of 1917, where, again, because of the tough times and the rioting, the striking organization, um, the Red Guard, which had sort of created an opposition to what the provisional government was doing, physically, violently overthrew the provisional government. Um, and that leads us to what's going to be our next video lesson, which is um, the Russian Civil War. So once the Reds hold St. Petersburg, that's going to lead us into an all-out civil war of what's going to happen next in Russia, who will rule, what the country will look like, etc. And that will largely be defined by, well, obviously it'll be defined by the winner of this war, but the winner is going to be the Reds, and that's largely defined by their leaders, which are Leon Trotsky, who's on the right there, and Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, who's below. And we'll talk about their beliefs in class. 
um, and they sort of unite enough people behind their cause, and the whites um, only, they get a lot of help from international powers, which gives them sort of a fighting hope in this war, but in the end it's going to be a red to prevail, but that'll be the topic for my next lesson. If you need this PowerPoint, it, or Keynote rather, it's on Moodle, so you can check it out there. Uh, I hope you got some notes down. If you have any questions, email me. Thank you.